Well, this has been a fantastic day one, and I am really excited to have our next guest with us here to wrap it up, and that is Tiffany Bova. Tiffany Bova is the Global Growth Evangelist at Salesforce and the author of the Wall Street Journal bestselling book, Growth IQ. She's been named to the latest Thinkers 50 list of the world's top management thinkers and is a welcomed guest on Bloomberg, CNN, Cheddar, MSNBC, and Yahoo Finance, among others. She also contributes to publications including Harvard Business Review, Forbes, Entrepreneur, and a number of other publications. Tiffany is a change maker whose thought-provoking and forward-thinking insights have made her a frequent keynote speaker like her joining us today, a guest on a variety of industry-leading podcasts and live broadcasts. We are really thrilled to have you with us, Tiffany. Tiffany, welcome. Oh, thank you so much for having me. I'm thrilled to be joining you today at the RevUp Summit to talk about breaking barriers uh, and accelerating growth, especially uh, considering the last 14 months and how so many of us are now getting back to the conversation of growth. So this presentation is called Growth is a Thinking Game. And again, you know, my name is Tiffany Bova. I'm the growth evangelist at Salesforce, and I couldn't be more thrilled to talk to you about this topic. It has uh, been close to my heart for many, many years, but now, you know, we're talking about it in a very new context. But before I begin in this presentation, I always like to set the scene and set the scene with something that we call the beginner's mind. In the beginner's mind, there are many possibilities. In the expert's mind, there are few. Now, what does that mean? We're at a crossroads. You have a choice. At this point in time, we can go back to the way things were, the status quo, or you can reimagine what's possible. If anything over the last 14 months has taught us is that we're resilient. We have the ability to leverage technology in new and innovative ways in order to bring value both to our employees and to our customers but it requires us to give a little space in our thinking every single day of things that might make us a little uncomfortable. And so get comfortable with being uncomfortable because growth and comfort rarely coexist. That's a great quote from Ginny Rometty, the former CEO and chairman of IBM. But ultimately a lot of this disruption, a lot of this change, a lot of this uncomfortableness is coming from the pace of this digital transformation. It's not slowing down. It's no surprise to any of you listening to this today, I'm sure. But what has also happened is we've seen this democratization of technology into the mid-sized business, into the small business. Everybody is taking advantage from all corners of the globe. Competition is coming from unlikely places. New partnerships are forming in order to become more competitive. Using technology to automate redundant tasks using artificial intelligence and machine learning to really drive growth in your organization from a sales, marketing, and customer service perspective. All of this happening simultaneously. And really at the base of this, it's about making these digital first decisions, building a digital first company. Now, how much change has happened? It's much easier for me to share this amazing study we did uh, that just happened in April of 2021. These are activities from customers that they're going to go back to most immediately, whether it be hotels, vacation, travel, flying on an airplane, shopping inside a store, eating inside a restaurant. But one thing we've definitely found in this particular category is we're tracking something we're calling the appointment economy. That means that people are willing to make appointments for products and services or for services in retail establishments in brick and mortar that they might not otherwise had done. Like we make appointments for doctor's appointments, maybe to get our car fixed. But did you do it in a retailer to go try on sunglasses? Now they're saying make an appointment or try on clothes or sometimes go grocery shopping. So ultimately this appointment economy has started to give consumers this feeling of safety, control, better time of their day. And so will that continue? We're not sure, but we definitely think that it's going to have impact on so much of what people do in their day-to-day -day lives, both personally in the B2C mentality, if you will, and then professionally in the B2B mentality. Now, the digital experiences that are changing, you know, this, we can't go back, you know, this black swan event that has changed so much of how we behave. We've become super consumers in our personal lives, and that is now bleeding into our business lives. So among consumers, contactless payments, 
shop via social media and within social media, using curbside pickup or buy online and pick up in store, actually using retailers now partially as fulfillment centers to solve that last mile. That's very different than saying we have an e-commerce business and we have a retail business. And they might connect at some point, but now we're really seeing that start to integrate across the board. 59% still plan to use video appointments as an alternative to visiting businesses. That may change the way you sell and service, may change the kinds of people that you hire. But that's the kind of reality we are now faced with. This next future is something that is upon us today. And how we respond needs to have that beginner's mind. So let's start with something that's really near and dear to my heart, uh, customer experience, and it really being this new battleground. Uh, I started talking about this uh, in my previous role. I was a research fellow at Gartner for about a decade, and we started saying that customer experience was the new battleground and that the CMO was going to spend more on IT than the CIO. And lo and behold, it actually came true. It was around the 2015-2016 timeframe. But what has happened since then as an accelerator, even pre-COVID, was these lines were blurring between B2C and B2B. And I started calling it sort of B to E, business to everything, everyone, and every experience. That means this customer experience has reached this tipping point. In our research, we find that 80% of customers feel the experience a company provides is as important, as important as its products and services. We actually think in 2024 or 2025, that will even out at 100%, meaning your customers are judging you not only on the products and services you sell, but what kind of experience they have through the entire engagement with you, how they find you, how they buy from you, how they get serviced and supported from you. And 66% of customers expect companies to understand their unique needs and expectations. Now there's no way to do this at scale without technology. Otherwise you find yourself here, right? I placed an order on your website, it still hasn't shipped. Well, that's the web team's fault. Oh, it's this team's fault, it's the inventory team's fault, it's the payment team's fault. Well, aren't you part of the same team? Nope, I'm only in charge of excellent customer service. So this disconnection shows that who owns customer experience is not just marketing, it's everyone. It's not just the chief customer officer, it's everyone. It's not just the chief experience officer, it's everyone whether it's the forms or legal documentation, the T's and C's that someone has to uh, you know, sign online before you sell something to them. Is it 100 pages long or is it one page long? Do you need to print it and fax it or can you accept it and sign it online? That has an impact in a customer's experience. And so with each group making these decisions in isolation, you have this unintended consequence of disconnected experiences. And here it is really laid out. This lack of consistency divides this customer's experience. The expectation is 78% of customers expect consistent interactions across departments. And in this case, we're talking marketing, sales, and customer service. But the reality is only 59% feel that that's the case. 72% expect a company's representative to have the same information about them. You know, that is that single source of truth, using data management platforms having a connection between those data sources, whether it's first, second, or third-party data. But yet 66% of customers say they often have to repeat or re-explain themselves to different representatives. That's not a great experience. Now let's just double click to what those images are below. That we found in a MuleSoft study actually that 900 apps in average are in an enterprise, yet only 29% of them are actually integrated. So who does that impact? It impacts the employees. And so we've done some new research around the power of happy employees, higher employee satisfaction, better employee experience, drives and results in higher customer experience. So much so that we see in, in increased growth rates because of it. Now, how you deliver these enhanced customer experiences requires those customer facing organizations to be connected. Now, the one thing I would add underneath customer service would be field service as well. We see so much opportunity for your field service to really have access to the same data, be able to proactively recommend a product to a customer when they're out in the field, or be able to solve a problem because they have all the information at their fingertips. 
And they're not challenged with getting that information at that moment of truth when they're sitting or standing in front of a customer. So how you do that is you have to enable teams to play multiple roles. You have to rely on that technology to break down those silos amongst teams. Now, that statement of breakdown silos I've heard for decades, but I don't want you to think break them down and take them away. I think there's value in silos. But what you need to do is build bridges between those teams so that they can share that information. Remember the slide previous, it, it was really apparent that customers are feeling like they're dealing with separate businesses when they deal with separate departments within the same company or brand. And so that's where those silos really manifest themselves in a way to maybe control that in some way is training, is metrics, is uh, you know bonuses, is commission, you know, is incentives, productivity metrics, whatever it might be to align teams more closely. And that really helps a lot. Look, people will do what they're managed and measured against. So if you tell someone not to stay on the phone longer than three minutes with a customer, if they're a customer service agent, yet the customer needs five or 10 minutes of their time and they hang up with them too early, it's a bad experience. If they stay on the phone with them for the full 10 minutes, sometimes they get in trouble. So that's those metrics that have to actually align to make sure that you pull everybody together with something that they can uh, align themselves to. And that is where that shared data across customer facing roles is super important. Now we've been talking about the single source of truth and customer 360 for so long, but I feel like we're finally at a point now where technology has the ability if used properly and the processes and organizational structure supports the usage of that technology. Tech alone can't solve these problems, right? A lot of it is a people and processes issue and not a technology issue, right? You have 900 apps, the technology probably can do everything, but if only 27% of them are integrated, that's not a human problem, that's a process and technology issue there. So really think differently about how you can do that. Now the manifestation of this and really growth you know, all up, especially at a top line perspective, is all about sales navigating these uncharted skies, right? Ultimately, we don't really know how it's going to shake out. Will field sellers come, or inside sellers go back out into the field? Will they stay inside sellers? Will some of the roles actually shift? And that goes back to what I was just saying is that we just don't have a technology problem. We have a people and process problem. Now, I'm just going to give myself as an example. You know, when I was selling, I was using, you know, an Excel spreadsheet, a little bit of post-it notes, and then I was using a single user version of ACT and then a single user version, version of Goldmine. But I always kind of kept the same habits and I was a field seller. And then I started running sales teams and running an entire division of a, of a Fortune 500 company. But this is the first time where I feel like sales is feeling a pressure that they've never felt before across the teams, the rep. Um, at you know the the organization and more importantly the role of sales operations these are all the challenges that your sellers are feeling today and whether you call them sellers whether you call them you know business development reps whether you call them account based marketers whether you call them uh, sales you know uh, uh, agents inside agents field agents vertical whatever you might call them it's really the responsibility of sales leadership to give all the capabilities, especially around things like reskilling and retraining because of the fact that now the customer has very different expectations of their organizations. And so really let me take us back for just a second. You know, way back when it was, whether you were a customer service agent or a sales rep, a customer would call in and you would respond. You would react to that inbound uh, initiation that they had made, whether it be a phone call, uh, or whether it be a letter, <laughs> or whether it be a fax, right, or whether it be a visit. And then we got to a point where we became much more proactive. Look, we see their credit card is going to expire. We now have the technology that can allow us to know that. Let's call those customers 90 days in advance so they don't have a disruption in service. That's very much being proactive, and that's absolutely table stakes. Uh, but now we've moved to something that is much more predictive. Let's look at that group of customers that came from that particular lead source. Wow, they have a really amazing lifetime value. They're showing that they buy more than one product, they buy more frequently, they're more loyal, uh, their average sale price or, or lifetime value is longer and better. From this particular source, it's not as good. So maybe we pull back on advertising there and double down over here. Or we have a set of customers in a particular vertical and we realize that they always use these two products. 
So why don't we go to customers in that same vertical that only have one product and offer them the second one? We may have a greater likelihood of getting them to actually purchase from us. Well, everything I just described cannot happen without data, cannot happen without your ability to analyze it uh, and use those insights to change the decisions you would make about business. And so when you think about it from a future perspective, here are three tips uh, that I often say, right? That tip one is align the entire team around that experience, whether they're in sales or not in sales, sales service and marketing. Connect your buying and selling process. Now, the buyer journey and the sales process meet at the point of sale. They don't normally meet ahead of time. Customers don't wake up in the morning and go, oh my God, I'm so excited. Today's the day I go from stage two to stage three in the sales process. They don't say that. They also don't feel like they're in a funnel. That's very internally focused. We have to make sure that we're connecting it in a seamless and frictionless way. And the only way you can do that is if you're paying attention to journey mapping from a marketing perspective, capturing that information from a sales process perspective, capturing what works at each stage, marrying those two things together and continuing to optimize in order to improve the way in which sellers sell. And then the third is super, supercharged sales with, with AI. Um, you know, it, often I hear kind of data is the new oil. Uh, you know, I didn't say that, someone else did. But what I add behind that is you can't pull up to an oil rig and fill your car up with, with gas. It has to go through the refinery, which is really AI. And then the insights is the petrol or the gasoline that powers the business. Data for data sake is not that interesting. You have to be willing to analyze it and take those insights. Now, it's hard to change selling motions in real time without potentially disrupting the current revenue apple cart. And so that seller's dilemma is real. But where you have an opportunity to really improve is to pull sales ops in early and often. This uh, stat above these three tips, 85% of sales professionals agree sales ops is becoming increasingly strategic, came from our state of sales report last year. It's great news because it means that those sales ops people are going to be able to have conversations ahead of when technology is deployed, what opportunities we have to optimize and improve what's already there. You know, do we need one more report? Do we really need 10 more fields in our CRM system? If we're gonna add, we should take away. So the biggest point I'd like to make on this particular slide is change management is your Achilles heel. You have to change at the pace in which your teams and people can absorb it, but you also need to make sure you're watching for what is working and not working. And that's why data, that's why the single source of truth, that's why sort of a customer 360 is so important and so powerful. And data never comes from one place, right? It comes from multiple places. So you have to make sure that you set yourself up to have access to it, share it, align teams, and go for growth in ways that has pure and true impact to your customers. So in the future, customer-driven organizations will completely reset the value and meaningful engagement with customers. There's no way around it. The employee has to be empowered and enabled to do what's right day in and day out with the right metrics, processes, and organizational support. More specifically today, it might be about reskilling, reorganizing, new business models, new kinds of customers, right? new go-to-market models. Lots of things are moving because of that beginner's mind. But ultimately, this is about improving the engagement with your customers. How you sell is interesting. What you sell is interesting. How your customers feel when they engage with your brand or your people is what it's all about. So the question is, what will you do different? What will you do different because of what you've heard here today at the previous sessions at my session? Ultimately, you have to just be committed to try something new. Even if it's a little 1% uh, pivot, once a week, at a team meeting, run it differently. Talk about these conversations. How are your teams using data? How are they using the technology? What's working? What's not working? Pull sales ops into your next meetings. Try to do an inventory of all the disparate applications and tools you have that are not integrated. And how could you get them integrated to make sure that you're giving everybody that data they need to serve your customers appropriately? But whatever you choose, be bold.
give it a shot. I always say, you know, if you're not going to hurt somebody or it's not illegal, go for it. The worst thing that can happen is you learn something. You either win or you learn. It's not about winning and losing. It's about learning. It's about iterating. It's about trying new things. It's about getting uncomfortable every single day so that you can push yourself and your people towards this next future where customers are far more in control of what they do with brands than ever before. So if you'd like more inspiration, if you'd like to dig deeper into the research I've shared, here's the link where you can get it. It's all free to download. The state of marketing, the state of sales, and the state of connected customer, which talks about the changing buying behaviors in both B2C and B2B by vertical, by size, and by region. It's full of so much amazing content. I've got a great podcast called What's Next with Tiffany Bova, where we talk about disruption and leadership, culture, diversity and inclusion. I've had amazing guests on like Adam Grant, uh, Dan Pink, Seth Godin. I've had Ariana Huffington, I've had amazing people on talking about a lot of the things that companies are grappling with today. And then, of course, my book, Growth IQ. Uh, she's almost three years old. She's translated into nine languages, uh, but still an amazing roadmap for growth today. Uh, the one key message out of it is the one thing about growth is it's never just one thing. So there's so much more we could talk about. But I want to thank you. I want to thank the Dun & Bradstreet team for having me uh, here today. And I think now we're going to open it up for Q&A. Tiffany, thank you so much. Uh, that was such a great presentation. Um, I, I really enjoyed the, the three tips for the future of sales. I thought there was some really good advice there and, and, and the, the closing statements around what are we gonna do differently and how are you gonna run your next team meeting? I, I think that there's a lot in there. And, and for those of you who didn't, um, weren't able to see or the, the sessions from before, there's materials in there that you can use to run your team meetings differently to bring the, your teams together and start to break down some of these silos. So Tiffany, um, actually one, one thing before we get into some of the questions, there is a Q&A box for those of you still listening, please enter your questions in there. We've gotten a couple that have come in already. So um, Tiffany, the first question that came in was, what would your advice be for companies who are looking to take that customer first approach and what role would data play in that strategy? Yeah, great question, because I think that uh, if you didn't sort of feel that thread throughout my presentation, that data is the Achilles heel of all the things I kind of suggested, that unless you're a very small company and sort of team of two, team of three, team of five, uh, but the moment you start to gain and gather more employees uh, and more customers, data becomes even more important. But I, I you know, hopefully um, it, it was also clear that it can't be customer first sort of in spite of everything else. It kind of has to be employee first and customer centricity so that you map those two things together. And really at the end of the day, right, you have happy employees, you're gonna have happy customers. And data is just one area. It's not the only area, but it's one area that plays such a critical role in being able to deliver that. Uh, mm -hmm. And many are overwhelmed by what they need to do when it comes to data. Like they feel like, oh, it's, you know, in 10 different systems and it's just never going to kind of show itself in one place and I'm going to have to clean it up. And it's a heavy lift, but it yeah. pays dividends in, in, you know, getting you closer to your customers and understanding what's happening in your business. Yeah, yeah, I totally agree. I think one of the reasons that, you know, we were so happy to have you join us today is, is the partnership that's, that Salesforce and Dun & Bradstreet has uh, created and established over the years to provide that kind of data, ma data management capabilities directly in Salesforce CRM. So there are opportunities to ensure that not only as data comes in, it's you know of a high level of quality, but then it's also maintained over time. And I think that those are the types of tools that can help organizations kind of break down those silos and leverage data more effectively. Absolutely, absolutely. And look, you know, obviously I work for Salesforce. I hope it's with us. But at the end of the day, you need to make sure you have that integration, right? Between your first party, second party, third party data coming yeah. in. And now, you know, how do we um, approach data in a way with the new regulations? Like there's so much complexity to that very quick statement. But I think that if you are committed to understanding how you capture data, who you integrate with, where you do it, how you use it, how you share that with your customers about how you use it. So you build that level of trust. Uh, yeah. But ultimately it's about emp empowering your people to, to do their job more effectively. 
Yeah. And one of the points that you made in, in, in your session was talking about empowering sales operations, giving them a seat at the table. And, and I think when you talk about uh, more effective use of data and, and AI and, and t taking things to a higher level, when you start talking about combining behavioral data with firmographic data, with technographic data, um, it makes me wonder, you know, why hasn't sales ops had a seat at that decisioning table until now? And, and, and how, can they, how can they either force that issue or, or how can teams work to understand the value that may be untapped in the sales operations uh, within organizations? Great question, because, you know, prior to joining Salesforce, I was with Gartner for a decade and I was a research fellow covering sales transformation and really the integration of multiple teams, specifically sales marketing and service and how that data, you know, was ultimately going to be shared. Uh, and what was the nucleus behind that tended to be IT, you know, sort of saying these are the tools and systems we're going to deploy. Uh, here's the training. Here's how to use it. You know, all of those things. But I think sales ops now has a much more uh, critical role, and we found that in our state of sales research, um, was a lot about making sure that you are watching the people process side of technology and not just the technology side of technology, right? As I said, we don't have a technology problem. We tend to have a people process problem. And that's where sales ops can be that translator between IT and the BU leaders. And so that's why I actually like the term rev ops. Uh, more than sales ops, because it's about generating revenue, which happens no touch online, you know, from good digital marketing happens via customer service or customer success on upsell, cross sell and happens with sellers. So it's really revenue operations playing a much bigger role in understanding. Are we making it more difficult or easier, right, for people to engage and buy from us and be serviced? Uh, yeah. And that's where I think you really have an opportunity to now if you're small and you're like, look, I just have a head of sales. Like I don't have a ops person, a rev ops person, a sales ops person. You've got to make sure that you have the discipline to carve out time for yourself. If you are the sales leader and there are no sales ops resources that you right. spend that same kind of time understanding how you can improve the business as well. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. And then one thing I might add to the, to the rev ops kind of definition is, is pulling in marketing operations into that as well. There, you know, sales and MarTech stacks have exploded and there are so many new tools pulling in so many new data streams that it really is a partnership between sales, marketing, customer experience and product to bring this data together and provide that, that insight uh, in, into the organization uh, and into what's happening in the marketplace. So yeah, absolutely. I, I, yeah, I mean, I think of, you know, Carrie Cunningham earlier today talked about the, the new demand gen cycle and understanding engagement at the account, not at the lead level. So if you think of marketing cast this wide net sales operations or revenue operations can help hone the focus of who the sales team prioritize their follow up with as a faster way to generate that revenue. Yeah, and, um, I, and, I, and I say the same thing about the term sales enablement. I also... Yeah change it and I call it growth enablement, right? Enabling people who touch customers. And it's always the triangulation of sales, marketing, and service. I, yeah. I don't talk about sales and marketing in isolation and I don't talk about marketing and customer service, but I think the same level of rigor that goes on between marketing and sales needs yeah. to also go on between marketing and customer service, customer success, and sales and customer service and customer success, right? That enablement and lead generation and understanding what's happening in the customer is a natural place to happen in sales and marketing. And yeah. this is a new muscle for so many companies to start to think about customer service as more than a cost center and really viewing it as a revenue generation engine. So, you know, revenue ops, and then I say growth enablement, right? Those are sort of two shifts that I, that I try to get people to think about. Yeah, hundred percent. Totally agree. Um, well, I, I think we have time for one final question. Um, this came in just this, the final minute here. So what's the best way to overcome leadership resistance to data and analytics value? This goes to that change management that you touched on. Yeah, that that's a really big question and that I can't really answer in two minutes. But the fastest way I've seen um, individual contributors or managers or directors, right, below the C-suite that are really trying to convince um, you know, leadership to think differently about data is to get them closer to the customer. So join a customer service call, you know, two hours a, a month, two hours a week, have conversations with the frontline people, understand why, you know, listen, 
I, I'm in customer service. I have to open eight things to find the answer for a customer. I'm getting in trouble for being on the phone for 20 minutes. It takes me eight to find the information. So if you could give me the information faster, I could cut that time in half, serve the customer better. And so sometimes it's just the space, right? And distance between an executive and the front line gets bigger and bigger. And as that happens, they get further and further away from that conversation. But if you're really looking to have data, uh, you know, and tell that story about what you're seeing in the data and how executives should think differently about it, but you're just showing raw data, it may not always um, inspire them to make the big changes. And so, you know, something as simple as a very good friend of mine, Nancy Duarte, wrote a book, Data Story. It's a great book on how do you take data and then tell a story that helps executives understand what the data is actually trying to share. And as you get better at telling the story from the data, it might also help them get more and more interested in the data itself, right? But if they just think, oh, it's this big thing we have to overcome, especially if it's in multiple sources, um, you know, it's your job to try to find the in. What is the pain point that, a, that an executive would feel that the data can solve? And if you can do that in a compelling way, they will start to come to you for the data versus you trying to force them um, to understand the power of it. But I think if you can get them closer to the customer and the employee, um, share what the data is telling that may be giving alternatives to decisions that they're making. Um, but all executives are at a crossroad. Go back to the way that it was, reimagine what's possible. And if you're going to reimagine what's possible, you've got to look at the data. That's great. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, Tiffany, we, we were a little bit over time here. But I just wanted to thank you very much for your insights here. I think it was inspiring and, and eye-opening for a lot of folks. Um, if any questions do come in, we may follow up with you and we'll reach out to those who did ask those questions. But uh, once again, Tiffany, thank you for closing out day one of RevOps Summit. Just a, a great way to kind of emphasize, again, the importance of RevOps as organizations move forward today. So thank you very much. Excellent. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for sharing uh, your time with me. Have a great day, everyone. We'll see you tomorrow.